taking a turn in order to return the power or the leadership khilafa to Ahlul Bayt. And the crimes committed under the regime of Bani Abbas is no less compared to that committed by Bani Umayyah. Imam al-Hadi undertook the responsibility of Imama at the tender age of eight and was martyred at the age of 41, which gives us close to about 33 years of Imama, which was led by Imam al-Hadi. For 33 years, he carried out the responsibility of Imama and the leadership of the Shia Ummah. When we look into the history of Imam al-Hadi and try and analyze his life, we understand that towards his period or in his period of leadership, we need to analyze the period in which he lived in Medina and then analyze the period in which he lived while he was taken to Samarra. For the first 12 to 16 years of his life, after undertaking the responsibility of Imam, Imam al-Hadi lived in Medina al-Munawwara. Sheikh al-Faqih narrates that from this young age, Imam al-Hadi would lead Salatul Jama'ah in one of the smaller mosques in Medina. And perhaps if we were to look into the indications from the books of history, it becomes very possible that Imam al-Hadi may have led Salatul Jama'ah in Masjid Imam Ali known as Masjid al-Fatih. For those brothers and sisters who have performed Umrah or Hajj, you may remember from maybe about at least 15 years or 10 years back that there used to be a number of masajids upon the hills, about seven mosques. There was the mosque of Salman and the mosque of Amir al the mosque of Sayyid al-Zahra, Masjid Rasulullah, and others as well. For this masjid known as Masjid al-Fatih, yani the masjid of Imam Ali, this place was made into a masjid because this is where, or on this particular spot, Amir al gained victory over Amr ibn Abd in the battle of Khandak. This is the place where Amir al was able to conquer Amr and Rasulullah said in his right, Darbata Ali Yawmal Khandak Afdal Min Ibadat Thakalain. The one strike of Amir al Mu'mineen on the day of Khandak is much better than the Ibadah of everyone within the realm of creation put together. For Masjid al Fatih. Imam al Hadi used to conduct Salatul Jama'a at this tender age within Medina, and the books of Sirah tell us that between this age of 8 to 20, Imam al-Hadi delivered the most powerful sermons in regards to tafsir of the Qur'an and explanation, yani tafsir, not only of the Qur'an, but of the Hadith al-Nabawi. And in addition to this, scholars had compiled an entire compilation of answers handwritten by Imam al-Hadi as a response to questions presented to him by one of his companions known as Yahya al-Aktham, Masail al-Yahya, they used to call. And within these books or within these answers, Imam al-Hadi's main priority was to ensure that the aqidah and the fiqh of the Muslim ummah remains intact without any sort of distortion. By the time of Imam al-Hadi, it was a dominant belief within the Muslim ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a body. 
It was a dominant belief within the Muslim Ummah that mankind does not have free will. Rather, everything that he does is imposed on him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jabr. The rise of the Mu'tazalites and the Ash'arites and the pace through which their ideology swept through the Muslim Ummah was because of the stamp of approval given to them by Bani Abbas. For Imam al-Hadi's primary objective or goal in Medina was ensuring that the aqidah and the fiqh of the right people, of the people are correct and away from inhiraf. In addition to that, the akhlaq of Imam al-Hadi with his unmatched ilm, the fact that he was humble, at the age of 20, the peak of his youth, when a person is leading Salatul Jama'ah and is unmatched in his history, in his fiqh, in his ilmul kalam, such that ulama from Hijaz would come to him to learn from him at this age of 20, the fact that Imam al Hadi did not have an ounce of pride in his heart, the hearts of the people gravitated towards him. For the numbers and the supporters of Imam al-Hadi, people who came into tashayyu' after seeing his akhlaq and his zuhud and his ilm, they began to point the finger at Imam al-Hadi that truthfully the leader of a person should be like this. Truthfully the leader who is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be like this. For during these first 14 to 16 years, Imam al-Hadi built himself a reputation amongst the people of Hijaz, regardless of whether they were from the Shia or from the Mukhalifin, to the extent that the leaders who were appointed by Bani Abbas in Medina felt threatened by the presence of Imam al-Hadi. For the leader or the Imam al Jama'ah who was appointed by the government in Medina al Munawwara, the Rasulullah, and in the Haram in Mecca al Mukarrama, when they saw the popularity, the rising popularity of Imam al Hadi, they wrote to Mutawakkil saying to him in Samarra that if you are in need of Hijaz to be a part of your Islamic land, then make sure you remove Ali ibn Muhammad from Medina. For Imam al-Hadi's arrest and his, ta his transportation towards Samarra, the fact that he was relocated to Samarra, was an action that was performed by force. Many historians are of the opinion that Imam al-Hadi willfully traveled to Samarra and willfully gave guidance to Mutawakkil to help him lead the Muslim Ummah. La, when we look into history, we will see that Imam al-Hadi was forcefully removed outside of Medina and forcefully taken to Samarra. Why at the age of 20? What? Powers did he possess within his thinking, within his ability to influence the people such that the government of the time would impose upon him such a move? Number one, his popularity through his character and his sincerity and his ilm. He won the hearts of the people. For the government was a government dictatorship Anyone that arises in power and whose ideology is against their ideology, then they cannot see him and they have to deal with this threat in an aggressive and in a violent way. Number one. Number two, during the time of Imam al-Hadi, the traditions in regards to the dhuhur of our 12th Imam, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Allahumma swalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad had increased in their numbers and in abundance. And it was Imam al-Hadi himself who had once said to a number of his companions in Medina that after me is my son Hassan 
and after Hassan, my grandson will be the Mahdi who will rise and fill the earth with peace and justice after it has been filled with oppression and inequality. For when these ahadith began to trickle down the Ummah and the Bani Abbas came to realize that the rising of the Mahdi, a prophecy that was foretold by Rasulullah, the time for the actualization of this prophecy has come. And the period between now and the time to when the Mahdi will be born is a period that is very small. And they knew that the Mahdi will rise up to destroy and crumble the dynasty of Bani Umayyah. For out of fear and to take precaution, they ensured that Imam al-Hadi will be brought towards Samarra such that he can be under the careful eye of the Bani Abbas leadership. For the rising popularity of Imam al-Hadi was a threat to them. Number two, the increased narrations and the talk about the rising of the Mahdi, which was a direct threat to the kingdom of Bani Umayyah, was another reason for them to bring Imam al-Hadi towards Samarra. Their hatredness in particular, Imam al-Hadi was brought towards Samarra during the Khilafah of Mutawakkil. Before Mutawakkil, Al-Wathaiq and the rest of the tyrants from Bani Umayyah, yes, they were forefront in their oppression towards the Shias of Ahlul Bayt, but not to the extent of Mutawakkil. The crimes committed under the leadership of Mutawakkil 14 years, if you were to combine the dhulm committed by probably all the other leaders of Bani Umayyah, they would not come close to Mutawakkil. He had an extreme hatredness for not only Ahlul Bayt, but for the followers of Ahlul Bayt. For when Imam al-Hadi was brought to Samarra, he was placed under house arrest. And the intelligence was spread across the Muslim Ummah to keep an eye on the activity of the Shias, to register their names, to blacklist their businesses, to refuse them any sort of government aid or help if they are known to have any sort of affiliation with Ahlul Bayt. In addition to this, in Mukhtabar al-Tawarikh, it is narrated that during the period of Mutawakkil, his first open statement of animosity and war towards the Shia is that he approached the haram of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Mutawakkil, the first tyrant in history to destroy the shrine of Imam al Hussein. For it is narrated that when he sent his army and their contingency towards Karbala, they announced that going for ziyara of Imam al Hussein is prohibited. Anybody who is seen there, their blood is halal. And even the people who had built their residences or their houses around Karbala, even their blood was halal. For it is narrated that Mutawakkil sent his army and they raised down the tomb that was placed above the cover of the Haram of Sayyid al-Shuhada. The land flattened down. Not only did they flatten down the land, Mutawakkil sent an order for them to erase the memory of this grave in its entirety. They say, the author says, that oxen or oxes were brought such that they could go and till the land, plow the land. You know, when they use these equipments or this machinery in the back in the days, they would have, they were like these spikes to say in simple terms, which they would put on the back of the oxen. And then they would walk through and what it would do, it would start to plow down the land. And these are the animals they used to plow down the land of Karbala. And Mutawakkil did not do this once in the 14 years 
in which he sat at the position of leadership, it is narrated that he destroyed the haram of Sayyid al-Shuhada 17 times. But subhanallah, one of the military officials who was given the task of destroying the cover of Imam Hussein and making sure that the oxen would walk over the cover of Imam Hussein and would dig over the grave of Imam Hussein, he mentions that every time we brought the oxen towards the grave of Imam al Hussein, to this place where you see the dhari of Imam al Hussein, the area that it encompasses, up to where the grave of Habib ibn Madair is. If you were to picture this image in your mind, he says, We brought the oxen right till the grave of Imam al Hussein. But every time we would hit the animal such that it may walk over the grave, the animal would stop walking. And we would flog or whip the animal until the animal would die, but it would not take a step forward towards the cover of Sayyid al-Shuhada. This person who was sent by Mutawakkil to erase the memory of Imam al Hussein and to erase the effect of Imam al Hussein on the Shia, this person who was in charge of this destruction when he saw that the animal would not move forward. And despite this, there was a smell of musk emanating from the grave. He says, myself, I became Shia. And Mutawakkil, upon knowing this, killed him. When they saw that the animals would not go through, they decided to flood the land of Karbala and flood the cover of Imam al Hussein such that his body would float to the front or on top of the land. The books of history narrate 17 times they tried to flood the grave of Imam Hussein. Every time they would flood the land of Karbala, the water would begin to circumambulate around the haram of Sayyid al Shuhada. When they saw that to remove or erase the markings of the grave in itself was impossible. And the people, after hearing stories like these and incidents like these, they would rush even in greater numbers towards Karbala. Mutawakkil put forward an official order or command saying that anybody who goes for the ziyara of Karbala must pay a heavy financial tax to the extent that when they had set up their police checkpoints or military garrisons on the way towards Karbala to collect taxes from the Zawar of Imam al Hussein, Al Muntakhab Sheikh Abbas al Kummi says that sometimes the taxes, or at a certain point, the taxes that were imposed upon the Zawar of Imam al Hussein was half their wealth. If you want to visit Imam al Hussein, half your wealth will be gone. Yet this did not stop the people for going for ziyara. He said that if you want to go for ziyara, your house shall be considered as property of the government. And your house is confiscated from you. This did not stop the number of zawar going to Imam al Hussein. For then Mutawakkil ordered a tax that should be paid in terms of the limbs of the people who are going to Imam al Hussein. If you are seen going towards Karbala al muqaddas the military would stop you and they would tell you, in order for you to proceed, you must have one of your limbs to be severed from your body. So the first time you go for ziyara, your right hand should be cut. And despite this, people went for ziyara. Until one of the military commanders says, that we saw a person limping on one leg without any arms. We asked him, what happened to you? He said, this is my fourth ziyara that I am going for to Imam al Hussein." said, in my first ziyara, they cut my right hand. The second year I went for ziyara, they cut my left hand. Last year I went for ziyara, they cut my right leg. Today I have come to give you my left leg, my fourth limb. They said to him, and how will you go to Imam Hussein? They said, I will continue to crawl on my belly to Imam al-Hussein. 
and from here the slogan comes up wa in katta'u wa in katta'u wa in kata'tum aydiyana wa arjulna la nu'tika zuhfan ya husain so the slogan made up by the shi'as where they would call out to imam husain saying if they cut our hands and our feet we will come to you crawling on our bellies ya husain and what you see today in this day and age in terms of killing of zawar in terms of destructions of the haram is a revival of the sunnah of bani abbas what you see happening in syria the destruction of the haram of hujar ibn adi sunnah of bani abbas the sunnah of mutawakkil destruction of jannatul baqi sunna of mutawakkil these are not crimes that the nawasib and the wahhabi have carried out in the 21st century they were their leaders and predecessors before them at the time of imam al hadi that destructions of the haram began when you look into the hadith of the 12th imam and it will be appropriate for us to mention this as we are in the month of rajab the tradition tells us from the alamat of the zuhur of the 12th imam what is from the mahtum those category of signs in which there is absolutely no doubt and 100% that will occur is that within the month of rajab from sham Sufyani will stand up and declare the blood of the Shias to be halal. How close are we to the situation in Sham? In fact, not only the Sunnah of Bani Abbas is being revived, but the Sunnah of Bani Umayyah in general and the Sunnah of Hind in particular is revived in Sham. a few days back and this is available for everybody to see on social media particular youtube where one person from the free syrian army hakikatan aynun najasa from the nawasib they have a 50 second clip for those of you who have the stomach to watch where they have taken the dead corpse of a Syrian soldier and he starts to rip open the chest with what seems to be a kitchen knife he begins to rip open the chest vertically and then he rips open the he widens the wound with the same kitchen knife digging across the chest or stabbing across the chest and with his bare hands he pulls out the heart of this person and he makes an announcement he says to the sect of the alawis that we will eat your heart and your livers and the worst part about this is that there is somebody filming from his own crew and the worst part about this is that he proclaims for a takbir so they all say allahu akbar and do you know what this person does on camera he takes a bite of this piece of heart in his hand is this not the sunna of hind the mother of muawiya in the battle of ahad when sayyid ash-shuhada hamza was killed she came into the battlefield and with a knife or with a sword split open the belly of hamza and took out a piece of his liver and bit from it where is the muslim umma without any form of hatred or without any form of arrogance or sarcasm but truthfully the sunni umma should be at the forefront of condemnation in this particular act because this army that has come in to attack syria 
As per the stories and the agendas that are pushed forward in Arab media is for the liberation of the Ahl Sunnah. No Madhab can accept such acts of violence and cannibalism. For him to say takbir is a slap for us on our face. He has nothing to do with Allah and nothing to do with Rasulullah. For people like these, the la'na of Allah and the Rasul is on them. For committing these acts against humanity and committing them or warranting them under Islam. Ahna, as a Shia community, Shia Ummah, we condemn these acts. And so should every human rights organization. Because this issue is not an issue of sectarianism. It's an issue or a crime against humanity. The Sunnah of Bani Umayyah. Sunnah of Hind. Which is why when you look into the traditions, the crimes that were created or performed during the time of Bani Abbas, the, times that were, the crimes that were created at the time of Bani Umayyah, before the Duhur of the Imam, the crimes that were committed by these two combined will be committed in our time, mine and your time. And Shahid, these are acts of, these are witnesses. For us, our heart bleeds when we see the pictures of what happened to the Haram of Hujar. What must have gone through the heart of Imam al-Hadi when the shrine of his grandfather was destroyed 17 times in his lifetime? But despite this, Imam al-Hadi did not stop people from going for ziyarah. He encouraged them. And in fact, he repeated the hadith that his grandfathers, Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, would say that a person who goes to visit Imam al-Hussein in a state of fear, Sayyid al-Zahra opens or raises her hands in dua for those zawar of Imam al-Hussein who travel in fear. Every step of them, Zahra's dua is with them. So they increased in their millions. In addition, the time of Imama in Samarra, Imam al Hadi formulated a critical strategy to ensure the continuity of Shiaism until the Duhur of the 12th Imam. What was this? Mukhtar, Ulama al-Rijal, a text which is commonly depended upon by the Ulama. It is narrated that Imam al-Hadi formulated the system of marja'iyya and taqlid during his stay in Samarra. People who attack this divine institution and create doubt on its credibility and on its origin have made a great injustice to history and a great injustice to the efforts of Imam al-Hadi. Imam al-Hadi in Samarra under house arrest. What did he do for these 20 years that he was under house arrest? It is narrated that Imam al-Hadi prepared the people and they used the fact that he is not accessible to the public to prepare themselves in self-administration and self-governance to prepare for the greater ghaibah, which is the ghaibah of our 12th Imam. In Mukhtar Ilm al-Rijal, or Mukhtar Ulama al-Rijal, it is narrated that Imam al-Hadi from Samarra divided the Islamic Ummah into four divisions. Each of these divisions was headed by one head wakil, and underneath him there was a network of wakala. These network of wakala would report back to the head of this geographic division, who would in turn then 
one way or the other try to communicate with Imam al-Hadi. These four divisions, what were they? The first geographic area that the Imam divided was the area of Hejaz, Yemen, and Misr. Misr being an expression for greater Africa. This was one geographical location where there was a set network of wakala who would all perform their activities at a number of levels. Some of the wakala were designated to collect khums. Some of the wakala were designated to collect zakat. Some of the wakala were designated only to answer the masail fiqhiyya. This was one division, one area. Hijaz, Yemen, and Africa. The second division was Qom and Hamadan. The third division was Basra and Isfahan. The fourth division was Baghdad and the areas surrounding the borders of Samarra. Each one of them in a system where the Imam gave them guidance on how they should run their affairs in the absence of an Imam, in readiness for the coming of the Twelfth. In fact, marja'iyya and this issue of taqlid, can a person do taqlid of somebody in the ghayba of the Imam is something there is no doubt in, laughable from the Quran and the Hadith. But on top of that, Ma'asum Imam gives you permission to do taqlid of a non Ma'asum while a Ma'asum Imam is present. Ask these people to give an answer to this. Meaning what? When the Imam is not in Ghaiba, when a Ma'asum Imam is hadir, present, the Ma'asum Imam gives you permission to go and do taqlid of somebody else who is not Ma'asum. Where is the proof? Sheikh Abbas al-Kummi Muntakhab and Sheikh al-Kulayni in Al-Kafi. They mentioned this tradition. Not during the time of Imam al-Hadi. As far as Imam al-Sadiq. He says, one of his companions comes up to him by the name of Humaid or Hummad ibn Jubair. He comes to Imam al-Sadiq and he says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, it is not possible for me to come to Hijaz all the time and seek answers for my questions that I have in regards to fiqh to you. The distance is a barrier. Number two, every time that I come to Hijaz, there is no guarantee that I will meet you and I can ask you these questions. What should I do, Ya Ibn Rasulullah? Imam al sadiq says to him, what refuses you or what stops you from visiting Muhammad or Muslim ibn Muhammad? Muslim ibn Muhammad being one of the greatest companions of Imam al sadiq one of the fuqaha of Imam al sadiq Imam Sadiq tells Humaid, go to Muslim Ibn Muhammad, whatever he says, he has said from me. Do you not know that he was the one who used to collect traditions from my father, narrator and collector of 30,000 hadith? Ma'asum Imam gives ijaza to somebody to come and take from Muslim Ibn Muhammad. Muslim Ibn Muhammad, is he Ma'asum Imam by Ismat al-Kubra? Does he have the same level of infallibility as a Ma'asum Imam? Is he mentioned under Ayat al-Tathir? La. Yet Imam allows the general people to take from their Masail Fiqhiyya from a Faqih who is credible and authentic. For if doing taqlid in the presence of an imam is acceptable, then by default to do taqlid in the ghayba of the imam is a no-brainer. It is an institution that was warranted by an imams and strategically formulated by Imam al-Hadi. And it was through his wisdom that this institution continues until today even though there might be people who try to corrupt it or try to slander it. The deen is qa'im. 
based on the efforts of the ulama and the maraja. It is through them that we begin to understand the words of Ahlul Bayt in the Hadith, their explanation, their juhud, their safeguarding. For this was a big part of the 15 to 16 years of effort that Imam Al Hadi spent during his time in Samarra making sure that he would come up or formulate an institution through which the Shias would have an outlet for organization and administration to facilitate for their affairs during the Ghaibah of the 12th Imam. And as the affairs of the Ummah, Fa'lan in reality, they began to administer themselves and there was a system for the distribution of wealth and there was a system of independence from this oppressive government. The suspicion of Bani Abbas and their treatment towards Imam al-Hadi began to increase in terms of severeness. To the extent that Mu'taz al-La'een, the last Khalif from Bani Abbas who lived during the time of Imam al-Hadi, eventually decided to end the, his life by poisoning him. Their suspicion of the Shia Ummah in how it was increasing in terms of its knowledge and its stability, they could not point the finger at Imam al-Hadi because these activities were carried out at a high level of secrecy. Not everything that is fundamental to your faith and fundamental to your survival should be advertised and disclosed in public. This is something that even a person who is outside the realm of religion, who has an iota of common sense will tell you what is crucial to us in terms of strategy, we don't disclose in public. Secret service disclose their policy for the entire nation to know. Secret service is accountable to the public. Or no? No. They manage the security of the state. They manage the best interest of the state. Hence their actions, they are not accountable to the public. They are above accountability because they safeguard the best interest of the nation. It is not in their interest nor in the interest of the state to publicize. For the same applies in terms of the secrecy implemented by Imam al-Hadi. He did not have to sit in Samarra and announce in front of all the people that I have set forward my institution of wakala. It defeats the purpose. For because of the secrecy which is underlined by his wisdom, the Bani Abbas could not clearly point a finger at Imam al-Hadi. But they knew that the Rafida, as they were called during that time, have taken him to be an Imam and are working actively under his leadership. But there is no way to prove it. For Bani Abbas, using their tool of violence in front of any perceived threat, decided to end the life of Imam al-Hadi. And according to narrations, it was on a night like this. In the first three nights or third night of the month of Rajab, Mu'taz sent food which was poisoned to the house of Imam al-Hadi with a number of his militia and those men who were in charge of ensuring that no visitor would come in or out of the house of Imam al-Hadi. The house of Imam al-Hadi knowing is where the shrine of Imam al-Hadi is today. This Haram al-Mubarak which was also destroyed. For the tradition say that this, the militia came forward with this plate of poisoned food and they put it in front of Imam al-Hadi. 
and they forced him to eat from that food. Imam al-Hadi, knowing that it was poison, had to succumb to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Askari states that as my father was poisoned, I sat by his side and I watched the color of his face change. At certain times of the night, as the effect of the poison took toll on his body, sometimes his face would turn red, sometimes his face would, would turn pale, and sometimes my father would sweat profusely to the extent that because of the burning and the heat of the poison, no matter how much water we gave my father, his thirst would not be quenched. I said to him, Imam al-Hadi, your situation is similar to the situation of your grandfather, Sayyid al-Shuhada in Karbala. Over here, Imam al-Hadi's thirst cannot be quenched because of the effect of the poison. And over there, Imam al-Hussein's thirst cannot be quenched because of the heat. Imam al Askari narrates that on the night that my father was martyred, I sat by his side. I put my head on his chest and I began to weep. Imam al-Hadi at one time gained consciousness. He looked towards me. He said to me, O oh son Hassan, grant my salams to the Mahdi. He says, grant my salams to the Mahdi who will come from you. For indeed he will avenge for my death. He will avenge for your death and the death of my grandfather Hussein. Every imam on his deathbed remembered Sayyid al-Shuhada. Imam Hassan al-Askari began to weep. Imam al-Hadi gave him his last wasiya. He gave him his inheritance, bestowed him with the imam. Until at one time Imam al-Hadi looked towards the sky and he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. He looked towards Imam al-Askari. He looked towards his wives. He looked up towards the heaven and he closed his eyes. The roof of Imam al-Hadi was raised up towards the heaven. The tradition tells us Imam al-Askari began to weep. He began to hit his face with his palms. He ripped open the front part of his dress. He began to weep. The people of Samarra came towards him. Imam al-Hadi has passed away. Allah, Allah, Imam al-Hassan al-Askari gave ghusl and kafan to his father. The most difficult thing for a son is to sit in front of the corpse of his father. But Imam al-Askari, at least for you, you were able to give a ghusl and you were able to give a kafan. But what about that son who lay in Karim and watched his father without a ghusl and a kafan. Allah, Allah, Imam al-Sajjad, he narrates to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he says to him, O oh Jabir, how difficult it is for a son to see the body of his father. But I don't think there is anyone on the face of this earth that he would want to give a ghusl to his father, but he couldn't because his hands were shackled by children. He says, Jabir, Jabir, when I came to bury my father on the 13th of Karbala, may Allah never show a son the state of a father like this. He says, Jabir, when I lifted the body of my father, the left side would fall down. When I would pick my father from the left, his right would fall down. He says, Jabir, do you know why? Allah, Jabir is without an answer. He says, Jabir. They went on the body of my father with horses. <coughs> they went on the body of my father with horses and trampled it to pieces, not living it together. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa la'anatullah ala a'da'ihim ajma'een. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
by the sake of Imam Al Hadi, Ya Allah, protect all the shrines and the harams of Ahlul Bayt in Syria, in the Iraq, and the remains that are there in Lebanon and in Hejaz. We pray to you, Ya Allah, by the sake of Imam Al Hadi, protect the Shia from the hatredness and the evil of the Nawasib. Ya Allah, protect the lives of all the Muslimin and Muslimat within the lands, whether it is in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Pakistan, or in India. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, unite the body of the Muslims against the Nawasib and by the haq of Imam al-Hadi, hasten the reappearance of Imam Sahib al-Amr. Ya Allah, through the shafa'a of Imam al-Hadi, any one of our family members or friends who are not in the best of health, you grant them shafa'a. All our family members and friends who have passed away, Ya Allah, <coughs> By Imam al-Hadi, turn their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Matama Hussain.